tents. I was just informed that someone said they will come when they have when we're in the book. They've clearly not understood what we are doing for the last four months. Is the book presumes you know what a Maronite is, and it starts with that context. So we're spending these months to do what's Aramea, what is happening in the Middle East, what are all these things, so that when St. Mary is born, he's born in a historical context. And everything that we're doing, even though it seems long, and it is long, we probably have another two weeks of doing this, and then we'll be in the book in November. But then the book will have lots of commentaries too, and you'll have more handouts. So you need to get a folder if you don't have a folder, just like in the old days when you were at school. Uh, so, um, it's the reason why we're doing these 11 points. This is going to give you the specificity of what it is, not only that, well, that what makes us as Syria, but then, of course, you have to understand the context in order to understand why we're Maronites within that, that Syriac context. Otherwise, we'd just be Syriac Orthodox or Syriac Catholic, Syrian Catholics now. You know, there's an entire church that exists, the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, or the Syrian Catholics now since the 18th century. But the Maronites are neither one of those, and we don't have the same liturgy, we don't have the same mass. Basically, it has the similarities, but we have an influence of both the East and the West. West, Eastern, and that East and West meaning Eastern and Western Syria, and then, of course, we have a huge influence of the Latin Church for the last millennium. So the Maronites are complete, completely unique among the whole Syriac tradition, but we have to know why the Syriac tradition comes up in the first place. So, at the end, I gave you this one sheet that has the picture of the three different churches, and it shows you the large blocks of all of these descendants coming out of the three churches. And it's very important to understand them because you'll notice that the Byzantine church comes out of Antioch. Someone came up with the question before about the five patriarchs, the Pentarchy and all that. That is an orthodox theory about the patriarchs and how they function within the church of God. But we'll talk about that later on. At the end of the first century, in the year 100, there are only three mother churches, Rome, Antioch and Alexandria. And as we've mentioned, and we spend so much time in the springtime on the Hellenic and Aramaic aspect of Antioch, you see it split in this picture. And the Hellenic part of Antioch goes on because of the foundation of New Rome in Constantinople. And that becomes the descendant of Antioch. But Constantinople isn't declared to be a patriarchate until the late 300s, you know, centuries, centuries after our Lord. And at the same time, Jerusalem is named as an honor. They both receive the titles of patriarchs as honors. And if things had been normal, and it hadn't all blown apart in the 400s, which is why we're spending so much time on these first four centuries, if things had been normal, we would have had ecumenical councils and we would have had other patriarch, patriarchates set up. Alexandria is the patriarchate of Africa, which is why now many of the African nations, the African peoples who are converting to Christianity, are actually converting to Orthodoxy. Now, eventually we would have had, for example, when they began the evangelization out in China, Certainly something like Nanjing or Beijing would have been set up as the Patriarchate of China, a Patriarchate of Tokyo. The Patriarchates only refer to the fact that these are the mother churches, or calling them Patriarchates, the father of all of these churches that will come from this one area. But at the end of the first century, the only apostolically established um, Patriarchates are Alexandria, Antioch, and Rome. And as I mentioned to you in the springtime, they are all St. Peter. Antioch is directly organized by Peter. Rome is directly organized by Peter. And Alexandria is established by Peter's interpreter, St. Mark. So 
if you look at it, when I mention also, it's you also, that the better thing for us to talk about when we speak about Rome <clears throat> is that we talk about them as Latin Catholics. Often we use the term Roman Catholic and Latin Catholic as if it were interchangeable. And technically it's not. Because the Latin Catholics are the Latin rite of the Roman Church. And the only reason why we refer to Rome and that aspect is because as a Roman Catholic, Rome is the center of the communion of all the churches in the house of God. So from that aspect, all of the Eastern Catholics are Roman Catholics. They all look to Rome as being the center of the order of the intercommunion of the churches that form the universal reality that we call the Church of God. And I mentioned to you also that in the Rome, there, isn't, there is a Roman rite, we use that term, but the Roman rite is actually broken into a number of them, the same way you see broken into uh, the different divisions under the Church of Alexandria and the Church of Antioch. And under the Church of Rome, just one of the things I wanted you to know is you've got three of the major Latin churches. You have Rome, the Roman usage, and you have the Ambrosian. The Ambrosian comes out of Milan in northern Italy. And you have the Mozarabic. The Mozarabic is the heavily influenced Islamic cultured Spanish church. That's why it's Mozarabic. And so it's a heavy influence of the fact that the Spanish peninsula was occupied for seven centuries by North Africans. And so, if you like flamenco dancing, well, that's just straight out of North Africa. It just happens to be in southern Spain. And so that type of a thing. So that's Mozarabic. Unfortunately, at the end of the 60s, a lot of these all got obliterated. These ancient traditions got obliterated. But the younger priests now are bringing them back. And so, the chant of Mo the Mozarabic chant, if you ever heard it, is absolutely exquisite. It's very Eastern, but it's all in Latin. But the musical melodies, you can hear the phrases. But you can also add to these three bubbles down here. You also have the Lyonne, L-Y-O-N-A-I-S. The Church of Lyon. Lyon is considered the primate, the main diocese, not Paris, but the ancient diocese of what's now France is actually out of Lyon. And it had its own right also. That's under Rome? Yes, it's under the Roman Church. You also have the Church of Serum, or the Serum Rite, S-A-R-U-M, out of Salisbury, in England. And that would have been the distinctly English form of the Latin liturgy in England if we had had the explosions of Henry VIII. So a lot of things that we look at that we consider to be Anglican are actually leftover usages from when they were Catholics in the Sarum Rite, S-A-R-U-M. And then, of course, we have the Celtic Church, which is very mysterious. But the Celtic Church, in many ways, is very similar to how Maronite Church was organized. And, of course, the Celts were also a Latin Church. Everything was in Latin, but they had very distinct practices um, until the 7th century in which Rome put pressure on them to acquiesce and to change over to use the more Roman rites, which they did eventually in the following century, century and a half. So you have the Celtic observances, you have the observances of Lyon, you have the observances of Serum, and you have what is called the Gallic Church in France, G-A-L-L-I-C. You can tell the Gallic prayers in the old Latin liturgy because they're much more ornate. They seem Eastern in many ways, and we have no idea what their origin is. We don't know why in France, except that through Lyon, you have St. Irenaeus and those in the, in the second century, they come out of Greece. And like Marseille, Marseille that we think of as being a quintessentially French city, was originally founded as a Greek colony. So it's always been cosmopolitan at the end of the Rhone as it goes into the Mediterranean. So you have the Gallic, and in the Middle Ages, a lot of the Gallic observances in Rome merged together after Charlemagne. 
So what we call the Roman right now is actually heavily influenced by the Gallic right. So you have a, you have a Gallic right, a Mozarabic right, you have the right of Lyon, and you have the right of, when we talk about the Dominican right, the Dominican right is the right of 13th century archdiocese of Paris. Because as the Dominicans would travel, well, you just said mass the way they said mass wherever you were at. But since you moved around a lot, you, it was confusing. And so what we call the Dominican Rite was essentially the way the Latin Mass of Rome was being offered in the Archdiocese of Paris in the 1200s. So since that was the Dominican's main house of studies at the University of Paris, they said, all right, we're all going to agree to do the Mass the way we do it at St. James in Paris. And that's how you get the Dominican Rite. So when we say Roman Catholic, we're all Roman Catholics because that is the center of, of the communion. But the Latin rite has many versions to it. They're all in Latin. Now, there were no vernacular liturgies. But they're all different. They have basic structures the same, the same way the Syriac rites have basic structures the same with the Busoyo in there. So I just wanted you to, do, excuse me, <coughs> to note some of these things. And then, of course, you see the breakdown with Antioch, the two great divisions of Cappadocia. So Cappadocia is central Anatolia in modern-day Turkey. And you see the Armenians in there, because the Armenians are actually heavily influenced by both this Hellenic church of Cappadocia and the Church of Syria. So the Armenians, because of where they're located geographically, they're, they're heavily influenced uh, evangelically by both the Hellenic Church of, of Antioch, because it's the Cappadocians that preach to these mountain people of Armenia. And then, of course, since Syria is just south of them, the Syrian influence is huge also. And the Syrians have a huge influence upon Ethiopia, the, the, the Syrians, as I told you at one point, the Syrian church eventually reaches Beijing in the 8th century, the 700s. So you've got quite, a, quite an apostolic work that goes on out of Mesopotamia. But then you'll notice that once they settle into Constantinople, the thing branches out into all these Eastern European countries. And you have that whole list there of all the different versions of what originally were Greek rites taken all over the place including southern Italy. So the Italo-Albanian rite, right, they were rites in Greek and southern, then they've always been there. Then they've always been there and they were always under Latin bishops throughout the centuries. And depending on who, the, sometimes you had moments in history where the Latins were like, can't you just be like everybody else? Right? So there were pressures on them to give it up, but they still exist. They're the very famous monastery outside of Rome called Grata Ferrata. Grata Ferrata has been there for over a thousand years. It's a Greek rite. It's because the southern part of the Italian peninsula is part of what we call Grecia Magna, Great, Greater Greece. It's the colonies of the old Hellenic world, that whole southern part. So you've got, you know, and of course that's where the Melkites come in. So the Melkites just happened to be ethnically Syrian people, but they use Greek rites. And there's reasons for that. But it's why the Maronites and the Melkites always hang out, because they're all cousins anyways, and they eat the same food and speak the same language. They just have different church liturgies, different church ceremonies. So, um, you have the listing of them, and of course most people don't know is that the Albanians were a Catholic nation until about 200 years ago, and they finally acquiesced and collapsed under the Ottoman rule. But for a long time, they actually were Christian. They're one of the most recent countries to apostatize from Christianity under the Ottomans. But it's why if you meet Albanians, they are blue-eyed, they're just European peoples who adopted Islam because of the Ottoman Empire. But there is, there is a residual left of the Albanian Byzantine Church. 
And then, of course, you have the whole block of the Syriac aspect that we've been talking about, where you have the Western and the Eastern Syriac branches. Okay? Now, we could argue over the terminology of pure Syrian, like the others are corrupted in some way. But what they're talking about is that's just the church of the Syriac Aramaic speaking people who just continue on and exist to this day in the form of the Syriac Orthodox Church. And then, like I said, for since the 18th century, the Syrian Catholics. Um, then, of course, Maronites there. And Maronites are there because, like I said, we're influenced by both Eastern and Western. When we talk about Edessa, Edessa is a huge formation, but it's considered Eastern and Syrian. And so you have the Chaldeans there. So the Chaldeans are Catholics because that Mesopotamian Aramaic church almost entirely all came back into communion with Rome over the last four centuries. Right? They're the people being exterminated in Iraq now. So when the wars began before America intervened over there, there were a million and a half Christians in Iraq. Most of them were Chaldean Catholics. And now I think there's about 300,000 left. Most of them have either been killed or they fled. And chances of them coming, going back there are almost nil. So we're going to talk about part of that Mesopotamian area, which the Greeks called Adiabene, which is what we're calling on CNN Mosul, and the Iraqi plains in the north. Right? That's the last part of what remained really of a Christian area left in Mesopotamia, in the northern parts of Iraq, okay? And then we have two other churches with funny names, Malabar. And those are the churches that are in India, okay? And you'll notice that the Malin Karis Catholics are cousins to the Maronites. They don't look like cousins, but liturgically and ecclesiastically they're cousins. And they are the people in southwestern India in the state of Kerala. Where the huge storms were just recently in Kerala. And where you have the massive protests going on now because the Supreme Court in India obliged one of the major temples, pagan temples there, to allow women to go in. It's a god of animals or something. So now you have huge protests. So you have a Malankar and then Malambaris. When the Portuguese arrived in the, 15, in the 16th century, there was only one Syrian church in India. But because of the coming of the Latins and the way the Latins kind of thick-fisted handled everything, it shattered into all different pieces. So you have Orthodox versions, we have Catholic versions, and now with the coming of the British and the American, well, the British specifically, you now have Protestant versions of everyone calling themselves Thomas Christians. Okay? That's a story for another day. It's very, very, very sad. So, and then of course we have the mysterious African church. The Coptic and the Ethiopian. They're quite different. The Ethiopian to this day are still very, very, very fervent. I, happened, I was able to go to the liturgy at the church in Addis Ababa, the cathedral of Addis Ababa. The place was absolutely jam-packed. The ceremonies, because they do morning offices, they start in the morning at 5 a.m. on Sunday and finish about noon. Okay, for all those who want 52 minutes. <laughs> now, not everybody's there from 5 o'clock until, until noon. Those who come for the morning offices, what we used to have is Lilio. The Latins call matins, the night office. They'd be singing that in the morning. But the liturgy, I mean, the masses for most of the East, including the, the uh, Maronites, lasted two hours easily. You know, in some cases, three. And that wasn't because of a long sermon, it's just the ceremonies were long. And so I got there probably about 11. And the Ethiopians all wear white shawls, men and women. They put these big white veils around, it covers their whole body. The women cover their heads and they put these around. And the little kids have them on too, but they kind of fall off because the kids are all over. And the women are on one side of the church, and the men are on one side of the other side of the church, which is the apostolic practice, the synagogues. It comes from the synagogues. Churches are huge. 
The church was so full, you have people outside. They have speakers on the church broadcasting what's going on at the altar. And people standing outside the churches, veiled, because there's no room in any of the pews anymore, standing outside the church praying and following the liturgy outside around the plaza area around. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. Now it was Sunday, but still very impressive. And it's impressive to see that Ethiopia is the only country in Africa that was never colonized, occupied by any European power, and it's also the only Christian, the historical center of Ethiopia. There's a lot of Muslims in Ethiopia, but the historical center of Aksu has, always, has been Christian since the 300s. Very impressive. So they're impressive people. And where they claim that they have the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, in Aksu. Yeah, it's a little chapel, but you had a crazy Australian once trying to get over the walls to go see inside this, and it freaked out all the Ethiopians, because no one ever goes in. No one ever goes in there. And it's, it's a succession of monks who stay in that building as watchers of the Ark of the Covenant. And when he dies, they elect another monk, he goes into that chapel, and he stays there until he dies. And they all end up blind. Blind? That wasn't the story they told us over there. But. It's, it's some, it's something about it that uh, they think there may be some, something in there that's really reactive, but uh, as far as they know, it's all going to end up blind. It's probably a tablito, because in the Syriac traditions, we actually use wooden boxes. Mm -hmm. So we use altar stones because that's a Latin influence, but normally we have consecrated slabs of wood. And that's what the liturgy is offered on, like the Last Supper. So that they're consecrated by the patriarch and only by the patriarch. So, but they have, it's a box form that they offer the liturgy on that they put on top of the altar. So the altar is stone, but they put this wooden, this wooden tablito on top of it. And it's probably this one of the an ancient tablito, which has become identified with being the Ark of the Covenant. But the Ethiopian church is all, it's a Semitic. If you listen to them speak Amharic, it sounds, it sounds like Hebrew or Arabic, especially if they talk fast. The, nor, the further north you go in Ethiopia, the more Arabic it sounds. And it's one of the reasons why when you look at the Ethiopians, they're fine-featured people. They're dark, like the Sub-Saharan Africans, but they're fine-featured. Because they're almost certainly, well, their language is a combination of Kushite Semitic. And they are probably genetically themselves Yemeni Africans. Because at one point, the Ethiopian Empire actually covers over the sea into southwestern Arabia, the Christian Empire. So anyway, so they're fascinating, but they celebrate the six Syrian saints. These men who came over uh, in the, I want to say, the 6th or 7th century. And the Ethiopian saints are always great, because they're always riding lions or leopards or something. They're always on an, a lot of them are animals, so they're great. It's a totally distinct form of art. Anyway, so that's Ethiopia. And, uh, and the cops, that's the, they're the Egyptian, it's the Egyptian church. Okay, so I just wanted to hand it out to you from last time. So you understand the richness of why we, why we spend so much time on this is because of the complications. I think the beautiful complications, the ornateness of the beauty of the spreading of the gospel. Now we also handed this one out to you last week. I wasn't going to look at on that corner of that table over there. <coughs> and I just wanted to point out a couple of things. We mentioned to you about Saint Irenaeus. You'll see him in the right column, third one down. Bishop of Lumduno. Right. Lyon, the city of Lyon. It's basically the Latins giving a name which is probably very similar to the name for London because Luco was a god of light for the Celts. So you can see that in the names, Lugdunum. But St. Irenaeus, who's martyred in 202 in the persecutions, he's from Smyrna, Izmir. And so he is a disciple of St. Polycarp, who is a disciple of St. John. And he was, he was a prolific writer, 
St. Irenaeus, because coming out of Anatolia, is the one who intervenes, because Pope St. Victor, at the end of the second century, was going to excommunicate the entire Eastern Church in Anatolia, because they kept observing Easter on the 14th of Nisan, the Jewish observance, as did the Celts. Now, how the Celts on one end of this civilization and the Anatolians did this, we don't really know the connection. But Irenaeus went to Rome to try to intervene and negotiate and pacify what would have been one of your first major schisms in the year one, in the 190s. Right? It blows apart in the 400s, but it could easily have blown apart at the end of the second century. Okay? Yes? One question. Why don't we celebrate Easter on the 14th of Nathan anymore? Because we're not Jewish. And so, the thought that at that time in the second century, in the Romans, they didn't want to be celebrating exactly the same time as Passover. It was considered unfitting. But they, while they're celebrating their liberation from bondage, we're going to celebrate the, 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 the death of our Lord on the same day. And it also seemed inappropriate to celebrate when we knew that our Lord rose on the first day of the week, which was a Sunday. And so therefore the plan was to put it on the Sunday after the 14th of Nisan. And because of that reason, it meant that it would never correspond to Passover, unless Passover freakishly fell on that day. So you always have the Sunday of the spring full moon, so the equinox. And the reason why that's done is because at that point in the northern hemisphere, the days are always longer with more light. And therefore the light of the symbolism of the resurrection was considered to be of first importance. So that's why it had to be the full moon of the spring equinox. But we still haven't gotten it straightened out. And the East is still, sometimes the Orthodox are together with us and sometimes they're a month off. And the Ethiopians have their own calendars. So sometimes they'll be off like to almost two months sometimes. Because they have their own calendar that they use. But the basic idea in the earlier councils at that point, and so it had been decided by that in the second century, and the Irish and the people in Cappadocia, in Cappadocia they wouldn't give it up because this is a tradition we have from John. We're not giving it up. There was a day when people actually would almost die rather than change their tradition. It's hard for us in the 20th and 21st century to imagine that because we're all for chucking traditions out the window, you know, if I don't understand it. Whereas the tradition is, the practice has always been, if I don't understand it, I'm the dummy, not the tradition. Now we go, the tradition's dumb, so get rid of it. But we always understood that what was given to us was something that was cherished by our ancestors and therefore must have value. And our effort was to understand why they kept this. That's why in the Syriac tradition, we use the term fenkito. Fenkito refers from the Greek actually to like a jewelry box. And the Fenkito became the name for one of our liturgical books that has all the specific feast days in it. But it refers to the treasure that has been given to us by our ancestors, something that is to be kept. So basically like your great-grandmother's jewelry box. So you go, I don't like this stuff. That ain't more than a deteriorate. Pitch that up, pitch that up. I can't believe she wore this. Pitch that up. No, it has a meaning because it was worn by your great-grandmother. So that's why it almost came to separation of East and West, because the, the, the Hellenic Church and the, uh, the Hellenic Church in Europe and the Empire and Rome had decided they were doing this Sunday thing, which actually, relative to the tradition, was the novelty. And Asia and the Irish kept the 14th of Nisan. Like I said, it almost came to blows, but Irenaeus, because he had grown up in the Anatolian tradition, went to Rome personally to intervene to not have, you know, everyone play nice. But the Irish celebrated Easter on the 14th of Nisan until the, 8th, until the 7th century. Another 500 years they went on to do that. Okay? So I just wanted to show you, because when you look through this chart, it's 
it's quite fascinating because you see they try to give you an interrelation of some of the major figures. And I want you to notice where St. Justin Martyr is here and St. Tatian. Those will be important. In the second half, we're going to see those people come up. Um, because um, Justin Martyr is born in Nablus. You know, CNN, things blowing up on the West Bank. Nablus, Nablus, Nablus. Nablus is an Arabic corruption of, of Flavia Neapolis, the Flavian New City. That's where Justin is born. He's born in the West Bank. So he's born among Aramaic-speaking people, even if he has a Greek name and he has Greek, at least a Greek father. So, but they're very, those two individuals are be very, very important to especially Tatian, to the Syriac tradition, all right? So those are the two things we handed out at the very end of the class. You can get a caffeine break, Nate, and then we'll go back to our points about the Syriac Aramaic tradition. Thank you. <coughs> With all the English speakers, it's exactly what we see now. And so what happened is, is these people converting Christianity, yes, and it's the important point to understand that these first two, three centuries, the liturgies are all in Greek. That's the language. It's the language that's in Rome also. You know, the church is using Greek everywhere because it's a common language for the common people that are around those, the Mediterranean basin. And then you get your Latin authors start in North Africa, really. I mean, you have Latin being used in Rome, obviously. But, take, for example, um, uh, I got Tatian stuck in my head. Um, <laughs> North Africa, mid second century. I uh, can't remember now. Anyways, Ch so he's he's from North Africa, and of course later on with Augustine. So there are Latin writing going on. People are speaking Latin, but the liturgy. Remember the tradition? It starts in Antioch. It's in Greek. <clears throat> when you travel to Rome, you take that ceremony with you. It's in Greek. So I mentioned to you as an example, we still have the Kyrie eleison, as Kyrie eleison, at least in the old Latin form of Mass until the 1960s. Now we just say, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. But it was still left even in Greek up until, you know, the middle of the 20th century. So the Greek came on. But this is why this number four was an important point, because the people on the plains who would be going to liturgy, they're going to be less likely to be speaking Greek. They're farmers. Bishop Gregory likes to bring this up. Our melodies, you know, these are peasant people in the fields. You know, the melodies that are catchy, no harmonies, one tone, all sung together, unified people. Even Saint Jerome talks about the people singing the psalms as they worked in the fields. They were not Negro spirituals being sung while they picked cotton. They were working in the fields singing the psalms back and forth as they, as they did this. Music was everywhere. Music was very important. But the language would have been, the language in the ceremonies when they were at church would have been in Greek. And that's fine. They accepted it. You know, they're being taught. And so, but they started just gravitating then in those, neck, in those first three centuries towards the places that were really speaking Aramaic, form of Aramaic. And that's why we mentioned the importance of Orhoi, of Edessa, and Mitzabin, and Tessaphon. Tessaphon was the capital of Imperial Persia, right, on the, what, Tigris, east of the Tigris. So, they, the people just simply looked to it. If you were a Honduran in the New Mexico, in, in uh, Long Island, like we were surrounded by, well, you listened to one of the three Spanish stations on the radio out of New York. Or you listen, you get, you watch the television on the Spanish channels. But it also meant you didn't have access to whatever else was being written or being said in Greek. Because you weren't, so you, it was quite natural. So when I say marginalized, it doesn't mean that they're being put down any more than the Hondurans are being put down by the English speakers of New York. But you just gravitate into a different culture, which is why by the <laughs> 400s, the Syriacs are like, we want a ceremony in Aramaic. We're done. 
And that will come up later on. But for the first 300 years, it's a Greek. Okay? So, that's an important point. Now we go on with number five. Tatian. Okay? Tatian. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to do St. Justin. Number five is St. Justin. As I mentioned to you, Justin is born in what these days we're calling Nablus. So, you know, they just recently bombed Gaza. Gaza will be part of the monastic traditions coming up later on. I mean, Gaza at one time was Christian also. Right? Now it's just a prison for Muslims. <clears throat> so Justin is born around the year 100. And he's martyred in 165 in Rome. So he's born in what at that time was called Samaria. Nablus, or what we call the West Bank today, at that time was being called Samaria. Okay. So he's born in Flavia Neapolis. His family are pagan, and he's a convert. <coughs> and Justin is famous for this because he was educated in philosophy. And as a young man, his whole quest is, what is the true philosophy? So he's taken in, in the second century, by the teachings of Christianity in the area around Jerusalem. Remember, there are Jews living and Christians living in this area, in Samaria, that it's only illegal to live in Jerusalem. And they don't expel them from the entire countryside. They only refuse them to be in the city of Jerusalem. So he has contact with Christians who are, you know, around this area, and he converts. That's why famously what he does is he wears the toga, the recognizable garment of the philosopher, as he teaches Christianity. And he very famously does his apologias. Now, our word in English, apology, means like, I'm really sorry. But the word apologia in the Greek means a reason, a justification of why I did something. That's why saying that I apologize and I'm sorry are not the same thing. When I say that I'm sorry, it means I've been pained by whatever's happened. Technically, when I say I apologize, is I'm now going to give you a reason why I did what I did. And so when we talk about uh, apologists or apologetical arguments, you're giving an argument of why you believe or hold a position. And so Justin is famous as the great apologist of the second century. He even writes public open letters to the emperor, which in the end is part of the reason why he gets killed. But he's writing a justification of why Christianity is not just simply something that should be allowed to be legal, but you yourself should embrace it because it is the true philosophy of life. Right? So there was a day when Christians actually thought intelligently about Christianity instead of just emoting. And Justin is the great example of who this is. Right? Like I said, in 165, he winds up being beheaded, but we have a lot of his documents and his writings still. That's why he remains famous, because these arguments that he gives are, are so important as a testimony of you know, that second century. Now, Justin's important because number six, I guess we have to take this down, we can't see lower than the canyon. Number six will be Tatian. Now, Tatian is going to have a direct, so Justin only has an impact upon the Syriac church because he's born in Samaria, and at home, since he's part of a pagan family, he probably spoke Greek and, as, at home, his maternal language, but the people all around him, he was almost certainly bilingual. Oh, I should have taken this off last week. Oh. All right, so you have Nerono as its testimony to stay there. <laughs> now, number six, Catinus, which has been Greece Hellenicized into 
Tatsianos, or we now say in English, Tatian. But the name actually is Titianus. Titianus. But in, in Syria, because he is, he is a, regardless of his name looking like a, a Greek or a Latin name, he's actually a Syria. He is born around the year 120, so he's slightly in the next generation of Justin. He is going to be a convert of Justin. That's why we, we I wanted to see, show you the connection here. He dies in the year 185. So, you know, these are, you know, he, so he's born around 120, so he also makes it to about 65. He is born, we don't know a lot about his life, but he's born in a place that the Greeks were calling Adia Bene. Adia Bene. This is the area of northern Mesopotamia. We talked about the plains of Mosul, the, the, plain, the Iraqi plains. And so this is the area that will be connected with the stories of Nineveh. Jonah, the city, its conversion. Mosul is basically the, the modern version of Nineveh. There are ruins of Nineveh, but they're near Mosul. All right, the same way Baghdad is in proximity to ancient Babylon. Okay? So he's born in this area which in Syriac is known as Hadyab. 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 That's the area. So it's it's an area. And it's an Aramaic speaking area. And what's important is the principle, this area converted to Judaism in the first century. All right? So these are Semitic peoples living in the northern plains of Mesopotamia. And the royal family accepts rabbinical Judaism in the first century. So basically contemporary with the coming of the Messiah. So he's born into a people who have left paganism behind, and he's like probably the second or third generation being born into an area which is also going to be, for obvious reasons, the churning area of rabbinical and Christian arguments back and forth. Okay? So Tatian is born into this what must have been a very exciting time. And now that you're discussing all these things, the, the Jews are certainly looking for their own confidence to win their own arguments, that no, this is the truth of the Messiah, law of Moses, and no, but that it's been fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, and it's back and forth. So he's probably born. So this is an area, which is one of the reasons why Edessa is so quickly going to become Christian because of this Judaic influence already, so they're already half there. And now you have to say, well, everything you've learned about circumcision and dietary laws, it's all fulfilled because that promised one, the anointed one, the one who is to come, has arrived. I mean, it's, it's impossible for us to imagine what it must have been to be living in a people who had just adopted Judaism, which wasn't their, they were pagan. They worshiped the stars, the moon, the sun. And then to say, but the fulfillment has come, which is why Edessa is going to become a huge, a huge center of Christian evangelization going out from this area. So Tatian is probably born, um, we don't really know for sure, but perhaps because of later history, slightly west, slightly west of the Euphrates. So in Syria, what's modern day Syria? And he's a convert and a student of St. Justin, of Justin Martyr. He goes to Rome. This is also part of the beauty of this story. These people moved around quite easily because of the Roman Empire. That's why we spend so much time talking about the empire, because the gospel just moves. 
It was not a measurable speed and relocation because of the empire. It was easy to move around. I mean, we think it was hard, but for them, when you're used to, you know, little villages with dirt paths, you know, all of a sudden you can travel on roads and there's postal places to stop at, it's pretty magnificent. So he also opens a school in Rome like Justin does. Justin's in Rome and is killed in Rome because he's in Rome and he's martyred in Rome because he was there teaching. So after the death of Justin, he leaves. Right? Tatian leaves Rome. Not because of the persecutions, but because he's being accused of what is known as encratism. Now, encrastes is the idea of the ascetic. And he, this is very much of a Syriac movement. We'll talk about it as we go on. The idea of a, of of fasting and of asceticism as being the path that we do to conform to grace. And some of the people came to the point was saying is, well, as our Lord says in the gospel, if being a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven is the most perfect form, well, then we should all really embrace it if we were all serious about following the kingdom of God. So some of the people came to the point of saying, well, then marriage really shouldn't be part of the gospel message. And they actually condemn marriage. Now, Tatian is not doing that. At least we don't have any evidence that he does, really does that. But he's clearly an ascetic. He's clearly in that mode. And he leaves Rome because the Romans, living in their million population, rather you know, frivolous lifestyle compared to most of the rest of the empire with its wealth, he leaves and he goes back home. He goes back to Mesopotamia. Okay? So the encritism, the word just literally means asceticism or self-control. When he goes back, which is why in that one left, you actually have him listed as saintation. Right? Marla, Marla Titiunus. Okay? He goes back there and he becomes a missionary now. So we think that maybe he was born west of the Euphrates and what's now modern day Syria, because it's where he begins to evangelize these people, Christianity. And he's going to create something which is going to have an enormous influence upon the history of the Syriac church for the next four centuries. Okay? So he's evangelizing and he's spreading the gospel all around Mesopotamia, and especially the Euphrates, so going further east, Persia. And that brings us to the next point, number seven. <coughs> the Dia Tessero. This is a book that we no longer actually have complete copies of, uh, which we'll understand as we go on. But the Dia Tessero, what Tatian does, and he probably does this because Justin was already doing this in a Greek form, is you take all four of, at the time, what are we called the memoirs of the apostles. We call them the four gospels. At the time, when you read like Justin, they refer to them as being the memoirs these are the recollections of the apostles. They give us the story of what they lived, what they saw, what they learned in that first generation. But in order to use it for, evangel for evangelizing, they would merge the story and bring it all together into one book form. Okay? And this is the dia tessalon. The word in Greek literally means through the four. You bring them together. And so you wrote a gospel. This is why the Muslims have the idea that the gospel, singular, is like the Quran. And instead of being, it was, was given to Jesus, 
instead of being inspired by Jesus and about Jesus, because they are also Semitic speaking peoples. So they're in a culture, the, the, the Christianity that the Arabs in the South would have learned was all heterodox. But they also would have been familiar with this Syriac Aramaic translation of the Gospels of a book telling you the story of Jesus from the beginning of the Annunciation, his genealogy, all the way to his death and resurrection and the ascension. One story, one place. So there's things like where we have the Sunday of, of, of the, the healing of Bartimaeus. One blind man outside of Jericho. But in the Gospels, you have another recounting of this story where there's two men, they're not named, outside of Jericho, who are also blind and healed. So you go, okay, well, we take one of these stories. And instead of having, well, two, was there two, was there one, whatever, it doesn't matter for the story. Right? And so you had about 50 lines of what we know as the Gospels, which are just gone because you have redundancies, or what were considered redundancies. And so he drops them. So that's your one story. Now what's important is this remains the official scriptures read in the church for the next three centuries. Tatian's version in Syriac of the Gospels. When St. Ephraim makes commentaries on the scriptures, his commentaries in the New Testament are on the Diatessaron. They're not on the four Greek Gospels. Okay? Kind of a cool detail. So the Syriac church stands out with this. So it's, so it's known in the Syriac as the Evangelion. So they just take the Greek word. Eon Gilion, Damhalte, Damhalte. So it's the gospel of the mixed. So they're aware of the fact that there are four mm -hmm. memoirs of the apostles. They know that there's four memoirs of the evangelists. But who's going to carry around four books and four books to be copied out by hand? We have one. It makes it easier. We can evangelize this one. And the story is the same. Now, it's going to have problems later on, we'll talk about it as we go on through the months. But at this point, this is the source of the evangelization that goes on throughout Mesopotamia. All right? The Evangelio Tamhalte. All right? The Gospel of the Mixed. Okay? And that is written about the year, between the years 160 and 175. So it's towards the end of his life. When he's in Rome, He's certainly using, we know that Justin had a Greek version of this. Now, what is argued over is whether Tatian actually uses a Syriac text, composes his own based upon the same form of evangelization they were using in the 100s in Rome, and reading in the Mass, or whether he himself composes it using directly those Syriac translations once he gets back to Mesopotamia, or did he take a Greek copy with him and translate it into Aramaic? We don't really know for sure. But it's a fascinating point because it is what the Syriac, of course, is one of the earliest translations out of the Greek that we have. And in fact, if you follow the writings and the thesis of Father um, Carmignac, the Jesuit in the 1980s and 70s, he believes that all three of the synoptics were not just simply not, you know, we have the, the, the tradition is, is that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew. But Hebrew is often interpreted as Aramaic, because that's what the people spoke. <coughs> Father Carmignac actually considers that they were written in Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. Classical Hebrew, not, not in Aramaic, but he thinks that all three of them were, and he wrote volumes of books of why he considers this uh, as being. And so um, there is a, a popularized version, it used to be published, I don't know, it may still be, with Ignatius Press called The Origin of the Synoptics, covering Father Carmignac's thesis. It's very fascinating. And part of that came, he was a Hebraist. You know, and professors do funny things, right, for entertainment. 
So one day he decided, I'm going to take the Gospel of St. Matthew and translate it from Greek into Hebrew. And he became struck at how easy this was to go through and do this. So then he decided to deal with the other Gospels. And once he, for example, translated from the Greek the canticle of Zechariah at the birth of John the Baptist, he realized if you put it in Hebrew, there's puns on the name of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Yohannun. There's, there's puns. With the, with the verbs and with the names in this poem. So he began to develop this thesis. So is there an Aramaic version, a Hebrew version of the synoptics which are floating around originally, put into Greek for the sake of the people in Antioch, so that someone like Tatian would have access to the Aramaic versions. This is still an argument that goes on among interpretations of Scripture. You know. So anyway. So Tatian is a very monumental figure of which almost we never hear anything about, but he has a direct impact upon the entire, um, the entire development of Aramaic Christianity. So it's a single gospel narrative but it's not in the order of the synoptics, because they don't tell exactly the same story. The way Matthew breaks down his story and the way Mark does, there's differences. So it's put together kind of like, here's the chronological story. All right? And of course, St. John is quite broken up and divided and, and quite symbolic, in fact, too. But it's not one of the synoptics. So it's basically what we're focusing on is the synoptics and John, but the four Gospels being brought together here, all right? And so, of course, the purpose is, is to resolve some of the disparity of the details. Now, in the end, this is one, one, of the, one of the last details, the final work, if you take all four of the Gospels together, the Diatessaron, because we have the Diatessaron, I think, in Armenian or something. We have text of it. We don't have the Syriac version of Tatian. We have translations of it. 72% of what's in the four Gospels are in the Diatessaro. Like I said, and the, and the rest of them were considered to be redundancies. Stories told with slightly different angles. Okay. So, um, so this was the standard text in the Aramaic speaking world from the 2nd until the 5th century, until the 400s when everything blows apart. And there's a reason why in the midst of everything blowing apart, they will drop the Diatessaron, and by the 500s, by the 6th century, they have what we now call the Peshitta, the Aramaic translations from the Greek, very literal translations, because what's happening in the 400s when everything blows apart over how are we going to describe Jesus? And that's basically what goes on in the 400s, is part and some of the text in the Diatessaron are being quoted as being equal scripture, as such, proving in their use of the text, the, mono, the, um, the Nestorian, what we call the Nestorian heresy. That's the problem of the Syria, the concreteness of Jesus and the divine word as being distinct beings. Intimately connected, our redemption, but distinct existential things, separate. And so at that point, the bishops who are remaining orthodox, non-Nestorian, they drop the diatessaron because it's being used against orthodoxy. And so by the sixth century, what we call the Pshita, becomes the dominant Aramaic text. Peshitta just means singular, or singular, it means simple. It's basically, when we use the word for the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, Latin translations from the 300s that, that Jerome puts together, the Vulgate just means in the common tongue, that's all it means, it doesn't mean it's disgusting. All right? it, the Vulgar language just means it's the common spoken language of people. The Vulgate's very easy to read. This is not Ciceronian Latin. 
and it must have been, a, and well, we know that it was a bit of an anguish to St. Jerome, who was a Latinist, to kind of just put this into common Latin being spoken. And so, and so what they did in the Aramaic version was the same. The spoken language of the people take the Greek text and put them in, and you get the equivalent of Vulgata becomes Pshita, Pshito. This is the common usage of the language. And that's actually our text officially, which we, which we still use in the Syriac tradition. I mean, here we're using the New American translation. And so, but there are slight little variations, and, and Ruth has become quite attached to one of the variations in the Gospel of St. Luke. Um, but there's little things like that. They're, they're fascinating, actually, some of these little distinctions. And if you're here, and I'm here, and none of us are dead, in the years to come, as the years go on, we're going to start looking at some of these distinct scriptural that will be your Sunday sermons. We'll talk about what the Peshitta tells us in this text. They give us a variety, give us a bit of variation to see the, um, um, the Aramaic interpretation of the Gospel. Now, when Justin quotes from the Gospels, we know because, of course, we have his writings, he's quoting from his form of the Greek diatessera. He's not quoting from the four separate Gospels. Uh, now, the Peshitta Old Testament, and we won't go into details of where it's coming from, because it's, very, it's, it's not the Septuagint at all. The Greek, it's not a translation of the Greek Septuagint. It is much similar to the Hebrew Old Testament, and even more so what it seems to be composed of is we mentioned last week what we call the Targum, the Targumim, the Aramaic translations. But the Aramaic translations that the Jews were doing even before the coming of our Lord were done precisely because people weren't speaking classical Hebrew. I mean, I give them to read the Gospel to you in Latin, but it's like, well, it doesn't matter. Right? And so the same thing, classical Hebrew, the, the, the Jews at the time didn't understand it unless they were educated in it. So, they would use, for synagogue purposes, they would use the Targumim. And the Targumim were Aramaic translations. The language that people spoke, but they, they weren't word for word. You take the basic idea. They were like the really bad English translations we were getting in the 70s of the scriptures. And it was like because they were more cool and down to earth kind of language people that understand. It's like, well, that's fine, but you're not actually giving the person the text. And you should tell them that. You should tell them it's your interpretation of that text. Okay? And that's an important thing. You will have entire screaming matches by writing between Antioch and Alexandria of how the scriptures should be taught, how they should be interpreted. So the Targumim, the Jews didn't really, they wanted you to get the message of the prophets. They didn't really care if you got the full word by word out of the Hebrew. So the Targumim, which make up much of the Old Testament Peshitta, are coming out of the Jewish converts, giving us the Old Testament, which is the foundation of the Old Testament version of the Peshitta that we use historically in the Aramaic church. And you can get really nice translations from Beth Marduto in New Jersey, but it's astronomically expensive, volume by volume, where you have the Syriac on one page and the English on the other page, and then you have a few notes that go into it. It's not a, the scholarly is the scholarly, the translation, and then they'll point out some of the differences of the text. All right, so. So the, t the last point is, this is probably why, as I mentioned to you, why the Muslims refer to the gospel as a singular. I and mean, we will use that term too, but we understand that it's not referring to the books. It's referring to the good news itself, the actual preaching of redemption. When the Muslims say gospel, they mean the book that Yeshua got, like Muhammad got the Quran. They don't know it. They never read the gospel. They don't. They have no interest in reading the gospel. And so when they talk about the gospel, they don't know what they're talking about. Because they're taught that whatever was important in the gospel, before it was corrupted by Christians, 
is in the Quran. So you don't need to read the Gospel. And that's why it's one of the reasons why it's, a, it's very difficult for Muslims ever to convert. They think they know it all. They think they know Christianity already. All right? And so the last point is Theodoret of Syrus. C-Y-R-R-H-U-S. He's going to be an important figure because he's the one who gives us the story of St. Mary. That's the only testimony we have of Mary's existence is from Theodoret of Kyrus. Kyrus. He lives between 393 and 458. So it's much later than this. Why so it's not a point right now here. But by his time in the 5th century, he is the person who takes, the bishop who takes it upon himself to start gathering up in the 5th century the diatessaron copies all around in the Syriac. And he has them put in storage, which is the Jewish way of getting rid of scriptures, and then they decompose them and you bury them. Okay? That's why in Cairo it has the most famous collection of Hebrew texts in Cairo, because you have all of these ancient texts that were put in storage because they were no longer usable. They're falling apart, but you don't throw things, you don't throw scripture away. So when they become too decomposed, you bury them, which is why we have no Hebrew scriptures predating the 13th century until we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's why it was part of the monumental discovery. Are there any questions? So Theodora, the same man who's going to give written testimony of the monks of Syria in the 5th century, is the same one who's also going to pretty much oversee the destruction of all the copies of the Syriac via Tessero, or the Evangelion Damhalte. Okay? Yes. Can you give a quick definition of what the Muslims believe? The issue is a prophet. He's born of a virgin. He was not crucified. That's a lie by told by Christians. Right? So he was because that God would never allow a prophet to be humiliated that way. So that was faked out. And there's a resurrection, and Jesus will be with God judge on the last day. So they've retained like Fragments of heterodox versions of Christianity. Yes. When I was at St. Xavier University in Chicago, there's a huge Muslim population there. And what they told me was that um, he couldn't be fully divine because he was born of a human woman. And they believe that he hasn't risen yet, but that he will be the first one raised at the end of time. Right, because there is no trinity. The trinity is explicitly condemned with 11 impure things in the Quran. Two of them being excrement and urine, three others being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then you can figure out what the other eight or the other, other six or five or whatever are. Now they list quite explicitly, God has no son, which is why whenever they refer to him, he's always Yeshua, son of Mary. Always. But you can see the great devotion paid to the mother of God, that even the Muslims in the very southern deserts of the Arabian Peninsula, their contact, even with heterodox versions of Christianity, the mother of God and the virgin birth stand out central. That's about the only thing they get right. Everything else is wrong. Yes? Um, when you said they buried things, like they buried them after... The scriptures... Were the dead scrolls buried for that reason or no I think they were they were in storage they were storage now why were they left behind we don't know exactly there are some who think that they they left because the Romans came and invaded the area I think actually this scenes actually converted if you read Cardinal Daniel Lewis book on Jewish Christianity you have influential Christian Essenes in Alexandria and in Rome, and certainly in the Middle East. And so a lot of the things you left behind in your community, they didn't take everything with them. And if you already in the Christian population are using the Targumim, you don't need a Hebrew version of Isaiah, because you have the Aramaic translation, which is what you're using anyways in the churches. So I think the Essenes, uh, 
they may have just left them behind. You know, just because they were in storage there. You know, we've all moved and left things in our garage, right? You go, ah, they'll take care of it when I get here. All right. All right, any other questions? Good. All right, we'll finish with our prayers. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh God, you are in four all ages, and exist in the age of age. You are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. O oh, radiant day and source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Messiah. To him with you and the Holy Spirit be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be. For a while. Amen. Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse for you. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Have all good, good evening. Uh -huh. so,